I want to read you something. Okay. Okay. Lauren has embarked on a new journey and chapter of her life. Away from her homeland of Canada, and we couldn't be prouder and what the future holds for her. But Lauren is used to taking on new challenges, blazing her own trail, being independent, tackling the unknown, rising to new opportunities and making things work, no matter how complex or complicated they may be. Leave it with Lauren and she will solve any task put before her, empower people around her and approach life with enthusiasm and confidence. I know we are the parents and you think it's only us who would say these things, but for all of you who know her, know I am not saying anything that you haven't seen or experienced yourself. Lauren truly is a special woman, mother, wife, sister, cousin, niece, granddaughter, daughter-in-law, friend, colleague, and daughter. How's that is that happen? my mom? <laughs> It is your mom. I thought I was like, Rose, that's how you feel? <laughs> that was my mom? It is your mom. How does it make you feel hearing that back now? No, that's, uh, it's it's nice. But I, I actually am happy to hear that and actually know that I've heard those words from, I've heard those words myself mm-hmm. from my parents, mm-hmm. um, which I think is really nice because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't ring like, I didn't know they felt that way. Um, it really rings like, yeah, that's that's what that's what she says to me. <laughs> like, so she'd say that in general. That's what own. she would say in general, you know. Like she would, you know. My mom, um, my mom, my both my parents. Uh, my mom is just a bit more vocal about her feelings. Okay, okay, <laughs> um, okay. But you know, my mom recently uh, said to me that she's like, it's weird because I watch you on the internet, and it's like, wow, she's a fantastic woman Mm -hmm. and separating you as the woman that is saying things that I understand that I resonate with that that feel empowering versus like seeing you as my daughter like in those moments I don't see you as my daughter I see you as like a completely separate entity yeah so that's really cool to hear and what's beautiful about that, at the end of the day, we just want to make our parents proud. That's yeah. it. So to hear that is like, wow, I, That's I did a good job. Yeah, and your, your mother is a nurse? My mother is a retired nurse. Um, she, she, that was the thing. She was, um, we come from a long line of nurses. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's typically how you made your passage to other countries is through like a nursing mm-hmm. degree. Like mm-hmm. that was your ticket. So, you know, my grandmother was a nurse, et cetera. Um, all, uh, my aunts are nurses. Which country? Um, from uh, my grandmother immigrated from Dominica to Barbados, then to England. That's where my mother was born. And then they used nursing again to give them an easier transition. My mm-hmm. aunt used nursing to give her a transition into the States. So that was kind of your ticket to start a new life. Um, my grandmother on my father's side, same, same thing, thing, right? Mm-hmm. Used nursing, nursing to leave Guyana and uh, go to England. So, um, yeah, the, so that, was her, that was her big thing. She was like, you could be anything you want to be. Mm. You cannot be a nurse. Can't be a nurse. <laughs> Do but, not be a nurse. So growing up with a nurse, you were like, I'm going to, maybe I'll be a nurse? Or no, you were no, like, no. I was never like, maybe I'll be a nurse. But I think it was just more like, hey, we are in a place now where the opportunities for you are not just one of these three things. Okay. Right? right. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas those were kind of the choices that she faced. So you can be anything you want to be, can't be a nurse. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, not to say that, you know, and it's also because she just wanted something. If that was like our calling and it was like, mm-hmm. she would just watch me every day at a bedside table, maybe then, <laughs> um, you know, but uh, no, she was just very much like, I want you to broaden your horizons um, and think differently than what she had thought. So, Yeah. I also have a passage for you. Oh, Jesus. What is this intervention episode? What are you, what are you talking about? We're just talking. <laughs> this bread pudding is not worth good custard. Yep. <laughs> what? What's that mean? What, what, what does that mean to you? <laughs> what does that mean to you? <laughs> you know, um, that's, that was my grandmother. Mm-hmm. She was uh, she, on my dad's side. She's passed now, but that is uh, that's the line that reminds me. That just reminds me of her love for me, 
Because I remember this one Christmas, I made bread pudding and my mom made custard. And I was like, would you like some bread pudding? And she said, this bread pudding isn't worth good custard. So, so I was taking a shot. Uh, it was, it was a uh, shot. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so I have a complex about like I'm, but it's good. It yeah. fueled my determination to make incredible bread to me. You know what? Now this makes sense <laughs> when you were talking about the pumpkin yeah. that you because uh, I came over here for Thanksgiving and I was like, you know, I can get the pumpkin, the pumpkin pie. And you were like, nope, I'm determined. I'm gonna make it. <laughs> so you're 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 scarred from childhood. Exactly. It's gonna be like C. Beulah. I did it. <laughs> What's like, what's a, what's another like, mem do you think you get any traits from your grandmother um, that you look on now and like, oh. Do I have any traits from Beulah? That's a grandma name. That's, yeah, yeah. That, that, for sure. That, that's, that's a grandma. That's a grandma name. Beulah. Beulah. <laughs> Not Hulu. Yeah. Beulah. You know what, I think I admire, it's, it's, I think that there are things that there's an there's an element of honesty that has been passed from Beulah to my father mm -hmm. to me, and that is not around like, um, it's around like, hey, call it for what it is, mm -hmm. right? Like, like my parents used to have this uh, phrase where, you know, you know when you're a kid and you bring home like a picture and you're like, look what I did. Mm -hmm. and you're like, can you put it on the fridge? And my dad be like, it's not fridge worthy, you know? This custard isn't this bread pudding isn't worth good custard. Like, I think that that there is that thing that I do carry with me. And it's like, you don't just get to anything, you know, mm -hmm. like you have to work at something you have to you there are there are ways to improve things. Um, and you don't just get to put your name on something and it's all of a sudden great. Um, and having people around you in your life who are willing to tell you like, no, actually this kind of sucks. Like you, you do better. Um, <laughs> I think that's something that I do embody even with my own kids. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I won't, I, you know, and it's, it's hard because I'm going to say something and please cut this out. So I don't sound like a terrible person or don't, but I remember this one day, um, Zara, my daughter was like upset because she's like, you don't think that I'm special or something like that. And I was like, First of all, that's contextual. You're special to me, but special to the world. You haven't done anything like you're actually you haven't done things yet that are exceptional yeah. to say that you are special or deserve different treatment from other people outside of this house. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, I think that that's a good thing because it allows in a world where I think so many people are entitled um, to that brand of I'm special, I deserve, um, you know, without really checking themselves first is, you know, a good thing. But on the other hand, I, I do try to temper it a bit more because I do think that carrying that narrative of you're not special hasn't always served me in my life either. Like, yes, it pushes me to work hard, to strive, to kind of check like who's in the room and mm -hmm. what do I need to do to get up there. Um, but at the same time, like I can shy away from asking for things because it takes a lot to convince myself that I'm entitled to it. Mm. I'm worth it. Mm. So it's yeah, it's it's kind of like how do you give someone it's always towing a balance between giving somebody like raw honesty to help them to see their blind spots so that they can improve while at the same time encouraging them to say like, but there is a path to better and I can support you on that path. Mm -hmm. I believe that you can do better than this. Yeah. And when I see you making those steps to improve, I will acknowledge you and I'll put your shit up on the fridge. But until then, until then do no better. Participation so this, 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 no participation awards. No participation awards. Get to it. <laughs> That's why you're a business coach. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and we'll get to that. But I wanted to go back to your mom's passage because that was after the fact. She's proud of you for everything yeah. you accomplished. But... You moved from Canada, from yeah. Toronto yeah. to LA, yeah. and you disrupted everything, basically. Yeah. You know, your children's comfort, you left a six-figure income to take this risk. But we always talk about after the fact, like what happened once you got here. But what gave you the courage to take that leap? Um, it was running out of external barriers not to. 
Um, one, it was the night, like, cause there, I, I, I wish that I could say that it was purely like this realization that I didn't want to ask, continue to ask myself, what if, um, but it was also like making those movements, asking questions and the barriers that I can kind of secretly hoped would like, oh, well, can't do it. Immigration won't let us, can't do it, can't do it. Those were getting lifted. And to the point where it's like the only person thing that I had to face in terms of making that transition was myself. It wasn't the government. It wasn't family. Everything around us was giving us the permission. It was more about, can I give myself that permission to step into something that's scary, that's unknown, and to start over in a lot of ways not start over from scratch but yeah like redefine things and i it i would say it was really it was really tough to do that i I even remember when we were talking about it and um you know like things were in process and we were having conversations and all that stuff and i was like we have to redecorate the kids rooms yeah He's my husband's like, why we're leaving? And I was like, we don't know, we don't know if we're leaving. We, just, we need to redecorate the kids' rooms. Like, it's a must. It has to get done. As like you could like see the claw marks. Yeah, yeah. On the walls of my home, because as much as I wanted to leave, yeah, I was as much as I wanted to explore that part of myself. I was very afraid that I couldn't meet my own expectations. It's one thing when you have a theory about something like, man, like we all talk about that, like, man, if I had just moved, if I had moved to L.A., I'd have been like this by now. Mm -hmm. If I if I didn't have, you know, if I didn't have small kids, I'd be this by now. You know, if I wasn't changed this nine to five job, I'd be this by now. But when you actually have to prove whether or not that's true, it's scary because as long as you're not taking action towards it, you can always keep that vision of yourself, of who you could be Mm -hmm. if these factors didn't exist. But now I risk killing that version of myself that I admired. (laughs) What I love about that is like, so many people in life never take that leap. Yeah. But all three of us took that leap, but we all probably have three different reasons. For you, you had to give yourself permission. For me, what motivates me to take risks is fear of regret. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I don't want I don't want to you think want how to you were saying like what if I can't I can live with failing, but I can't live with what if mm-hmm. like that's hard and I always say why not go for it because I can always come back like you could have went back to Canada if it didn't work like of course your pride would have been hurt but you could physically have gone back and started back with more mm-hmm. in a comfort zone if you wanted to and that's the thing though is that that's what everybody kept saying mm-hmm. and when we were talking about it, everyone was like oh, well you can always come back. Mm-hmm. And I really had to deny myself that narrative. Yeah. Like, no, there is no plan B. If I can't make it the way that I think I can, if we can't pull it off, I'm going to keep figuring it out. This is, there is no plan B. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is no coming back. There is only plan A until such time that you exhaust that dream and you can start to look around and like realize but there is no if i fail i'm going to keep figuring it out i'm not coming back so you burn the ships Mm -hmm. it was like that one war story Mm -hmm. the the commander said burn all the ships if you want to live we got to win yeah if you Mm -hmm. want and it's it's funny because a lot of times it's not that it's more so, it's not that even we're afraid, but we're more so afraid of the opinion of others. And I feel like, you know, you have people at the job, you have family, you got people, so you're like, if this don't work out, you're not even thinking about yourself, you're like, what are they gonna say? What are they gonna say? And what are they gonna say? And that's a, that's a tough hurdle to get over too. Did you deal with any like anxiety during these times? Like up late nights? <laughs> she was like, I can tell you. Did which you one you hear want? me trying to redecorate? <laughs> <laughs> what were you listening to? <laughs> it was so, it was so, so hard. Yeah, like there's the anxiety and then there, but then you just kind of can immerse yourself in the logistics of it all. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, book the moving truck, yeah. this and this and that, yeah. you know, like things are going. What I wasn't prepared for was the emotional toll it would take. You know, we envision what it's going to be like to quit our jobs Um, But what we don't take into consideration of what it's like to break up 
with a hundred people you've developed a relationship with over like 11 years, mm. 11 plus years, mm -hmm. the amount of breaking up I had to do, or we all had to do yeah, over that yeah. time, the toll of, you know, the kids, you know, looking at you and being like, why, why, why are you doing this? Like, we're so good here. We're so happy here. And, you know, they can't wrap their heads around it. And you're just keeps giving them the message like, you know, it's hard, but this is going to be better. And in the meantime, you like you actually don't know that it's going to be better. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't know. So the emotional toll of breaking up with everybody, coming here and trying to immerse yourself into this feeling of this is great. This is a fresh start, but you're still mourning the loss of an entire life. You're mourning the loss of an identity and trying to fast forward into a new identity because you have so much to do. You know, you got to get the kids enrolled in a new school. You got to get a home. You got to get a car. And, you know, thank God for Chris because because he especially because he was able to kind of keep his job. He could be that steady ship. Nice. Yeah. Who was just like, yo, you're fucking rocking all over the place. But like we're, we're this at least will be steady. So he could take care of a lot of the logistics. Um, but even for me, the identity of now having to rely so heavily on my partner, that's not something I was ever trained to do. <laughs> I was always trained to not to, to not rely on men. Right. Um, and not be a nurse. And not and be a not nurse. Be a nurse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and bread pudding. <laughs> Do better. <laughs> Don't be a nurse. And don't rely on that. See, we got lessons. We got lessons. We got lessons. We got lessons. But yeah, so it was um, definitely a, a tough, a tough transition, yeah. a tough year. Um, but you know what? The thing that I kept grounding myself on is, I don't know how long your family has been. Uh, living in the States. But for me, and most of my friends, like we're first generation Canadians. So I would constantly like look to my parents, look to my grandparents, and I'd be like, they did this shit, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. they packed up left families behind, you know, like started with nothing came over with less money, less access, less, less privilege. And they figured it out, they found a way. And when you put it in the context of that, it felt a lot less brave <laughs> in a sense and just more like, yeah, just do your job, like <laughs> do the thing. I wonder how even with us moving to California, we yeah. were 24, 25 years old, like, but we were coming to something. Yeah. So I wonder how it would have felt if you were like knew you were coming to some like I felt like we were ready to go because we were like. I mean, we this our new life. Like we we going. So I wonder how we would have felt at that time if everything would have been like stripped away. We'd have came out here with just like, all right, we don't have no manager, no agent. We don't know. It would have been definitely would have been much different for us too. But we felt that that safety of like, all right, well, we got a manager, we got an agent. Yeah, we got things so we got, some, up. got some YouTube going on. It's, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure <laughs> but when you don't have nothing, that's uh, yeah, that's that's tough. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. So as a business coach, yeah. you likely have to be a great listener to others. But I wanted to know, did that skill translate to you being a good listener to yourself and your inner thoughts and how that helped your mental well-being? Big time. I think because the more you listen to others, the more you recognize that your thoughts are not your, like, they're not your own in a sense of like, you're not the only one who experiences this fear. And I think that when we get into these cycles of fear and self-doubt, we can convince ourselves that no one else feels this way and it's just you and there's something mm -hmm. wrong with you. But the more you listen to others and, you know, others are forthcoming, it's like constantly looking at a mirror where they're like, how are they in my head right now? And that when you are able to normalize those thoughts and those fears and those feelings, then you're able to process them better without shame. Because shame stops us from processing those thoughts. Like, why do you, you know, the fact that you even think this is terrible. You shouldn't think this way. And that doesn't allow us to, like, really listen to ourselves and start to, like, be problem solvers. It just makes us feel shittier. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say that absolutely it, it, it has given me that ability. Vulnerable bonum. See? So, 
I feel like I'm a decent listener but I don't think I'm, I could be better at it because I tend to cut people off when they're speaking and I know that's one of my flaws and I've been working on it. But you made a post that really resonated with me that helped me out. And it was like this arm theory where you listen to the elbow to the fingertips. I want to know if you can just elaborate on that. I thought that was beautiful, beautiful and it helped people like me. Well, let me ask you this. What makes you interrupt people? Some of the same things you were saying, I think my mind is moving so fast is that when you make a point, it's like, oh, I can just answer that right now. I think I know where you're going with this, so let me just answer right now, or I don't want to forget it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was saying you were like voice notes. Like, don't leave me no long voice. I can't remember all of that. You want to so, process it? Yeah, I want to yeah. process yeah, 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 it, yeah. so I just respond. So yeah. it's not like out of this being, I think I know better. It's just, it's the way my brain works. Well, I mean, because you said two things. You were like, <laughs> here we go. All right. <laughs> Let me get out of coaching. We did this last time. Because you said, when I hear people talking, mm -hmm. I, I'm like, I think I know where you're going. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think I know better. So which one is it? No, I just feel like, you know, sometimes, like, oh, I know where we're about to get into, where this convo is leading. So let me just stop it right here before you have to waste your time elaborating. Right. I already know what we're talking about. Right. Or, you know, it's just my mind has worked so fast that sometimes I got to think, don't say nothing this way, this way. It's been, I don't we, want to forget we comedian, it. Like we comedian, that's our background. So we're ready to sometimes get the joke off, too. Yeah. And like, so jump, <laughs> you want to jump we're in. We're used to quick responses <laughs> so much, so it's tough, but... Your post helped me with that. I was like, okay, you put it in perspective. That's why I like, can you break like a, down yeah. that that yeah. that whole perspective that you said? If cutting people off at the elbow saves them time mm -hmm. <laughs> and also helps you to get your response out quicker, why do you want to do anything different? Because I'm not always right. It may not have been where I thought it was going, so I had to wait and listen. So that's the main reason. That is what the, the process is, is mm -hmm. that... You know, for me, it would always be like, exactly as you said, all right, I know where this is going, so let me help you get there faster. Or, you know, a, a, an ego thing for me was, I don't want you to think that you're educating me right now. Mm -hmm. That would be a big thing for me, especially in like corporate rooms or whatever, where I'm always trying to be like, I'm just as smart as you. Like, you know what I mean? So <laughs> don't finish that sentence. I already had that yeah. thought. Um, but it is the, you know, when you are listening to someone, we are often often listening to the to the elbow because by the time we get to the elbow, we've already decided how we want to respond <laughs> and what we want to say. Mm -hmm. And so we stop listening here. Whether or not we let them finish, mm -hmm. we stop listening right here. Yeah. But when we actually give the space to listen to the fingertips, to let them complete their thought, we actually might be missing a ton of information that happens here, which is why like when I'm coaching people, even if I cut them off at, you know, I'm looking for, and we talked about this last time, like I'm, I just need to be more consistent and I cut them off there. And I was just like, cool, let's find a plan for that. We're missing a lot of the why behind what the impact of inconsistency is doing. What is the impact of you not listening mm -hmm. to people's full ideas? You know, what is the impact of, because there's no right or wrong in my opinion. I'm like, if you're getting the results you want, if you're getting your ideas off, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're getting your ideas off and the other person is saving time, why change anything? Yeah. But it's because I'm, I think I'm missing valuable information that could help me to broaden my perspective or solve, help someone solve the right problem. Do you think in business that can vary? Cause so like, if you're dealing with your employees or somebody like that, like maybe it is best that you kind of cut it off and, and you know, that's where it can get tricky. Maybe in interpersonal relationships, it's a little different than business sometimes. Or it could, like, do you think it matters in business? With, of course it matters, yeah, yeah it matters. I think, um, Empathy is probably, or like active listening is probably one of the most important business skills that you can have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not just about personal stuff. It's about like, how am I ever going to get to innovative ideas if people don't bring them to me because I don't listen to them anyways? Because I'm always like, oh, what's the point? Because you're moving too fast. You're moving too fast. So you're so narrowed in on the perspective that you have that you 
aren't even gaining access to the ideas that I might have in order to make a situation better. And so then why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> why yeah. am I here? Then we can't innovate. We can't, we can't see things through a different lens. We can't have a diversity of thought. And it's just performative diversity. Like, look, I've got people around me who think differently, but I don't listen to them. But <laughs> checking the boxes. Here's my team. They all are innovative. They think differently. I don't really listen to them like that. Yeah, I don't have time. Yeah. I don't have time. I have time to rely yeah. on what I know to be true. That's what I have time for. And context, as you get older, makes a lot more sense, especially when you're in this social media realm where you see the you see the clip and you're like, I hate that person. Then you go back a month later and you see the full clip and you're like, oh, they're actually really nice. <laughs> what is yeah. here? There's, 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 there's a story. There's, there's, there's a story here. You know, the funny thing about it, your, your post helped me, but he also told me something that he learned from someone that helped me with being a better listener. You, yeah, from our mutual friend, uh, JD. Yeah. Shout out, um, JD. But he had told me one time, I don't know if he, he heard it from a psychologist. I, I'm not sure, but he was like, when somebody comes to you and either needs, you know, they, they come to you with a problem or situation, you ask them, do you need my ears, my head, or my heart? And I thought that was beautiful because if they just need your ears, then they just need you to listen, you know? And if they need your head, then maybe they want your opinions on what they, if they need your heart, then they're looking for that empathy, that connection. I was like, that's such a beautiful way to kind of, if you don't, it kind of disarms the situation, if you don't know what the situation is about and things like that. So I think that's, I think that's really, really good, especially, I think in relationships and in, in, in business, uh, all those things, like, do you think you're a good listener, even though you're a coach? Do you think you have problems sometimes maybe um, not listening or cutting people off or? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Did you not listen to what she said? It's a muscle. It's a muscle. Yeah. And it's like, it's a muscle. It's, it's not a natural thing for me to do. It's not a natural thing for humans to do because our brains are wired to tell. We're not wired to, like, be curious. We're wired to judge. We're wired to, um, yeah, we're wired to instruct, to position yeah. ourselves as an authority. Um, a really cool exercise is, you know, um, if I were to, you know, if it was just me and you in a room and your objective was to teach me how to tie a shoe or teach me how to tie a shoe, how would you go about that? You're really asking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm really asking. I would teach you how I was taught as a kid, you know, it was the they did the little bunny rabbit ears and then wrap it around that whole Tell a story with it or something. There was yeah. a rhyme that'll yeah. stick in your head. And it depends what age you are. Yeah, well. If yeah. you're a kid, do the bunny ear. If you're an adult, all right, that's how you do it, bro. Tighten it. He'd be like, no, give me a rhyme. I want to hear this. <laughs> Tell me something. Tell me a story. <laughs> all right, that's how you do it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> that's how most people would do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Listeners, on the other hand, the first thing they would do is say, what do you know about tying a shoe? Mm -hmm. They would get your voice in the room first before they just make an assumption that their idea their way is the way <laughs> or because again that's that's how we are wired to um perform so i think that it's some we, we we like to say i like to say that i'm a great listener but i also know that that muscle for me can get exhausted so by the end of the day like ask my kids i'll cut them off left right and center left, right, and center, like, oh, we don't have time for this. Like, yeah, let's yeah, just let's go. Let's go. Um, because it does take energy. It does take focus. It does take power. It does cause you to have to slow that inner dialogue down and park it. The one that says you have a better idea. You actually know how to fix this. Just tell them, just tell them to be curious and to listen. And things do get in the way. Things do get in the way of my, I remember I did my own um, emotional intelligence assessment and I scored low on empathy. And I was like, fuck, what? I was like, I am Mrs. Empathy. <laughs> and I'm trained to be empathetic. However, what I realized is that my barrier to empathy shows up when I feel that I'm in a place where I have to defend myself. If I have to defend myself, I no longer have empathy for you. I stop asking you questions. I stop listening to you. And I just start rhyming off all the reasons why you're wrong. You're in survival mode now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it made sense at the time, the time when I took the mm -hmm. assessment based on what was going on in my life, some of the conflicts that I was having, interpersonal conflicts I was having, that's what was showing up.
So that's why you yelled at me in our first session. No, I'm playing. <laughs> well, speaking of sessions, I wanted to ask because the story of you getting your first client mm. is a great story I want you to tell. But why do you feel as humans we got to be thrown in the fire for us to act on our vision? Because if that didn't happen to you the way it happened, you would have took a longer time to get to the point you got to. Yeah. And, you know, anytime that um, someone is looking for motivation to do something i'm like find a deadline that's not in your control and then work backwards from that because when it's in your control we can just very easily like ah, it's cool you can just let that because when it comes to we will prioritize things and we you and i did this exercise before in terms of urgent and important mm -hmm. right our brain is constantly prioritizing what's urgent and what's important. And if it's anything's in the urgent and important bucket, it's in the drop everything and do it. The, dis, the, the bucket where it's important but not urgent, like, you know, there's no real consequence if you don't do it, it sits on the, it sits in the plan bucket. Like you could just keep planning things forever, yeah. um, leaving things on the back burner. But when you give something a deadline that's not in your control or not as in your control, then you increase the urgency. You increase the consequence for not showing up. So well, that's that's really why why you gotta create that fire. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta get gotta get that Can fire. You tell that story though, how you got your first client. Yeah. A lot of people want want to be coaches these days. A lot of people have courses and everything. So how did you go about getting your first? So I I had registered for the coaching certification. And I put on my Instagram, you know how like they can, you can like flip things like to be public figure coach or whatever. So I put coach and uh, I put it up there. And then I, two seconds later, like took it back down again. Cause I'm just like, no, you're not a coach. You're not a coach. You, you know, people aren't gonna come to you for this. And then I was like, don't be stupid, Lauren, just put it back up again. So I was like, okay, put it back up again. And then like three hours later, I was like, take it back down. <laughs> just. And I kept kind of ping ponging that way until like one day I was like, you know what, Lauren, just put it there. No one reads the Instagram bios, like no one cares. So I put it there. And then like two weeks later, someone who read the Instagram bio <laughs> came in my DMs and she was like, hey, I noticed that your profile says that you do coaching. What does that look like? And I was like, I have no idea. That was, that's my internal dialogue yeah, yeah. is like, oh shit, like I, I actually don't know mm -hmm. what, what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so of course I say to her, like, I, 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 before I responded back to her, I was started like Googling like coaching websites. I was like, well, what are all these other coaches doing? Like, what are they offering? What, what can I say? What's the script? So I came back to her and I was like, oh um, yeah, I absolutely do that. And uh, what we could do is we could set up a free consultation because that's what I saw other coaches doing. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, we can figure out if this is the right fit for us. And she was like, great, how's Friday? And I was like, fuck, I was like, that's like two days from now. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, absolutely. We set up a time. So I had like 48 hours to figure this out. So I hadn't started like my coaching certification program. So I actually didn't know how to lead a coaching call because I had done like executive training and an executive training, like they teach you coaching because again, listening is a big part of business. Um, I knew that it was about asking questions. I got that part. So I like started Googling like frameworks for a coaching session. And um, so anyway, she comes on the call and you know, I'm like hyping myself up before the call because I'm just like, it's okay. Like you're the expert. She's coming to you mm -hmm. because she doesn't know what to do. She's lost. She's broken. Like these are the narratives in my head. Anything that you come with is going to be amazing. It's going to be magic. And that got me on the call. And then when I get on the call with her, she's like rhyming off like her master's degrees, like her, the fact that she does like, you know, career coaching for students and universities and this and this. And I was like, oh shit. I was like, She's smarter than me. <laughs> I can't help. I can't help. She's smarter than me. And it is so, speaking of listening, when you have that internal dialogue that's so loud, the imposter syndrome that is so loud, it is very difficult to tune that down and just pay attention to what the other person's saying to the point where I don't even, I don't even think I remember what she said beyond that point. I just remembered like, okay, Lauren, just keep asking questions. 
So I kept asking questions and eventually I got to a question that caused her to cry and to realize something about herself. And I was like, fuck, did it. And then she came off and she was like, okay, well, how do we continue this? How much do you charge? And I hadn't researched that far ahead. So I didn't know. <laughs> but I did know enough that coaches were charging like at minimum, like a hundred bucks an hour. So I was like, cool. I don't know what I'm doing. So let's go half of that. So I said $50 and she's like, okay, well, how do I pay you? And I was like, I, I'm like, you know what you do? I was like, sometimes you just have to really sit with something first to see if it's really right for you. So give yourself 24 hours. And if you're still thinking about this in 24 hours, then come back to me and we'll work this out. And that 24 hours was a requirement for me to figure out how to do everything that she was trying to do. So I can set up this payment. So I like downloaded an ebook of like, so you want to make money as a life coach? <laughs> Listening to that while I put together like a website just in case she was like, why should I pay this girl $50 an hour? So I put together a whole website, developed a PayPal and then was able to invoice her. And like, yeah, those things, um, I was, I've, I've heard a stat that said that 80% of coaches will never make more than minimum wage an entire year. And the reason is, is because they're working on their website. <laughs> because it's very easy to hide behind the things that, you know, make you seem official but you're actually not doing anything. So it's like, I'm working on the copy of my website. I'm trying to, you know, get my pitch perfect. I'm trying to get my service perfect versus doing the thing that makes you want to vomit, which is telling people, this is what I do mm. and actually doing it. But when you do that thing first, the thing that makes you want to vomit first, the whole plan gets accelerated. <laughs> and what I was planning to do in 18 months, I did in 48 hours. That's how it works. And what I love about that story, everyone who's successful started out that way. Yeah. Like everybody you gotta has build. to have their first client, yeah. has to have their first uh, seminar or whatever, and you got to learn from it as you go. So mm -hmm. I love that story. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's all we've been doing. That's all we've been known for doing is jumping in the fire and just, figuring, I don't know. It out. Just, just figuring I'll, out. I'll I don't even think that we know how to do it any other way at this point. <laughs> Figure out as we it's go. actually interesting because um, that's actually a narrative that I've been trying to reverse this year mm -hmm. because I am very good at like, you just fuck it, start doing it. You'll figure it out. Like, you know, Lauren, you should launch a podcast. It's like, okay, let me just start a podcast. And <laughs> as I go, I'll let me pick up out. something and go. Yeah. And now I'm kind of at that point where it's like, you're just going fast for the sake of going mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of like, you've done a lot of that. Um, now maybe it's time to slow down map out the trajectory yeah. and be a bit more strategic versus just trying to satiate this need you have to look like you're doing shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sounds like we need a business coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> so you've had, it's Lauren Elizabeth. Yeah. Make the shift with Lauren. Yeah, but, but I, I think make, that's gone. Make okay, but no, these are these are ones you've had, oh, yeah, I believe. Okay. Lauren Elizabeth. And, yeah. and then, coach, you're you're now now it's Coach Lauren Morrison. Yes. With these shifts, can we talk about the battle between like internal identity and external identity? Ooh. I just want to, you know. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about, like, where these trend, like, where you at maybe with East transition, and now it feels like you've settled on what, like, this feels like, all right, Coach Lauren Morrison, like, those trend, those transitions. Yeah. Like, when you can feel like you can actually lean in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, part of it is what Instagram will allow you to have. I'd just be Lauren Morrison, <laughs> to be honest. Gotcha, okay, but there's just okay. Too many. If, I, if I kept my maiden name, if I was Lauren Boudram, it probably wouldn't have been Coach Lauren Boudram. It just would have been Lauren Boudram. Gotcha. But uh, there's too many Lauren Morrisons in the world. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, that being said, though, it, uh, 
I do it actually before that. So before even coming to LA, it was rebuilding Lauren. <laughs> then it got switched to this is Lauren Elizabeth. Okay. And um, so yeah, there is a little bit of identity shift that happens with these external personas mm -hmm. when it's like, what is the phase that I'm currently leaning into right now? Mm -hmm. Uh, rebuilding Lauren was a time when I felt like I was going through that like quarter life crisis where okay. you're just sort of like, yeah. who, 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 who are you? Like, what are you doing? And, you know, cause you're moving through life so quickly. Like you're doing all the things that you're supposed to do that you're supposed to do. You know, you finish school, you get a job, mm -hmm. you know, you get married, you have your kids, you buy your house, you put a pool in the backyard. And then you're just like, I'm actually not really feeling whole right now. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what I've told, but I'm not really feeling whole right now. So that became sort of the journey of, like we talked about earlier, like starting to listen to myself, mm -hmm. uh, to actually start to understand when I'm thinking of doing certain things, like I have to ask myself, like whose voice is that, <laughs> right? Who said that? Whose voice is that? <laughs> whose voice is that? Um, so yeah, then it was really kind of about like, okay, I'm, I think I'm done rebuilding and I'm just ready to sort of step into, this is who I am. I'm figuring it out, but that's just part of it. And, um, and then, yeah, make the shift with Lauren was kind of me saying like, I'm launching a brand now. And now coach Lauren Morrison is like, don't be confused on who I, I am. <laughs> like, don't you ever forget. Don't you ever forget. <laughs> So I know earlier you talked about imposter syndrome mm. and with all these name changes, it seems like a little bit of imposter syndrome and mm -hmm. IG, but how can we use, because a lot of times we view imposter syndrome as a negative, but mm. how can we view it as a benefit to us? It's a huge benefit. I actually can sometimes think that I'm more scared of the person who doesn't have imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I wonder if like Donald Trump has imposter syndrome. I really do wonder that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. And it's like, but do I look at him and be like, oh, that's the kind of person that I want to be, a person who's free from imposter syndrome? <laughs> Maybe his bravery, <laughs> his resilience. Yeah. But actually, you know yeah. what's funny is like Donald, I remember when Donald Trump got elected and it was around the time I was like changing jobs, like stepping into a new career and I was so nervous, that imposter syndrome, like, Oh man, what if I fail? Blah, 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 blah. And at that time you turn on the news and like you have people rioting, yeah. telling this guy not to come to work yeah. <laughs> in the like, streets. And he's just like, but I'm here. I got voted in. <laughs> <laughs> What's your problem? What are you talking about? <laughs> um, but uh, imposter syndrome, it's, it's a, it's, it's a tool, but we often look at it as something that is holding us back. Like we always say like, oh, I, you know, my imposter syndrome keeps holding me back. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, no, no. It's the value that you give to the imposter syndrome mm -hmm. that is holding you back yeah. because imposter syndrome is a natural reaction mm -hmm. to, you know, a fear that's happening inside of you because every, our brain is constantly trying to protect us from one very basic emotion, which is embarrassment. <laughs> Right. That's really what we're because embarrassment can lead to social rejection. Social rejection means that you're no longer on the in group. You're on the outside. You're on the outside. You have less access to resources, less access to survival. You're going to get eaten by lions and tigers and bears. That's how your brain maps like embarrassment Everybody. to mm -hmm. your survival. Mm -hmm. So imposter syndrome is just a natural reaction to stepping into an arena where you haven't necessarily proven yourself yet. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you use, if you look at imposter syndrome, the value you give it is an authority to be like, oh, if I'm asking myself, who do you think you are? Then, then maybe I don't belong in that room because the people in that room, they're not asking themselves who they think they are. Mm -hmm. They figured it out. No, the people in that room are, you know, have those, that kind of imposter syndrome, that fear of being embarrassed, that fear of being found out the same way as all of us, because we're all wired as humans. They just have are a little bit better at using that imposter syndrome as a collaborator mm -hmm. to kind of check themselves. So mm -hmm. it's like a personal audit. So you're not an authority and I don't stop the conversation with who you think you are, but you're a collaborator in a sense of, okay, let's take stock of all your accomplishments 
And then let's take stock of like where your gaps are mm -hmm. so that at least you know, you can be honest with yourself on, yeah, these are all the things that I have. These are some of the things that I could be working on. And then now you're not in the room being like, who do I think I am? But you're asking yourself instead, like, well, what's my next step? Which I think, so that's how I think that imposter syndrome can be an ally. And I tell people like, actually use it to help you to strengthen your pitch because mm -hmm. If you have imposter syndrome, you're asking yourself the hard questions in advance, yeah. right? You're asking yourself, why should, I, why should I invest in this? Why should anyone believe in this? Mm -hmm. Then you can strengthen your pitch to ensure that you're selling that idea. Yeah. But if you don't have imposter syndrome, if you, don't, if you don't ever do that check and put yourself in the shoes of someone else, challenging your idea, challenging your identity, then you may come underprepared to answer those questions in the room. Yeah. So we always hear in like in business, it's just numbers, it's analytical, it's not emotional, but we're humans, we have emotions. So does emotions play a role in business, especially when you see the clients you're coaching? Yeah, 85 to 90% of your actions in business are driven by emotion. Mm -hmm. And that's because emotions are inevitable, like they are constant. And when we talk about like, it's not business, it's not, emotions it's in we don't bring emotions in business it's like we also acknowledge the fact that in business we feel inspired we feel motivated we feel frustrated we feel pissed off so we actually do acknowledge that emotions play a role in business but there's about three acceptable emotions that we'll take you know the other ones it's like don't you dare <laughs> don't you dare mm -hmm. don't you dare feel sad don't you dare feel defeated don't you dare but all of these things they are happening inevitably and if you choose to believe that they're not guiding your decisions then you're not in control of them you're not managing them mm -hmm. somebody in uh, might have been in the recent book i read the slight edge by i think jeff olson i believe his name is um he was he was saying like, people forget the most important part of emotions. And he was like, that's the motion part. He was like, they not called East Standing Stills. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's so funny. Okay. I was like, that's really good. He was like, people forget like they, they move. They, they, move. they, they <laughs> it's an emotion is like, you have to understand like, all right, it's gonna be here for now. Then we're gonna let that go. Another emotion is gonna come in. And like in business, you go through ups, you go through that. So all of that like mixed together, it just, it makes sense. So when he said, when he said East Standing Stills, that was so funny to me. Um, speaking of emotions, though, I just just thought about it. So we talked about. So she, you have a yellow chair out here, yellow and chair. the yellow chair, big yellow chair, we sat out there. You got some emotions out of me, right? So you got some internal things that I was dealing with at the time, and I know with you as a business coach, a mom, a wife, all the things that your mother said that you were, you still go through struggles yourself. So I was kind of curious, what is an internal struggle that you've dealt with over the last three to six months that you're like hurtling over or figuring out. It's not even, I'll say three to six months, but it's more, it's a lifetime. Okay. Um, it gets louder every three to six months. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not standing still. <laughs> um, and it, I don't know if it's an emotion or a belief um, I, I can't think of what emotion to tie it to. It's, it's definitely a fear emotion, but the belief is that I'm too small. Hmm. That's, that is a belief. Like my role is to play the background. My role is the shadow. My role is the support system. I'm too small to play big. That is a belief that gets triggered hmm. anytime I'm changing doing oh, okay. things stepping yeah. like if there's like a spotlight and it's like lauren step in you're like there's no. that hesitation <laughs> you're like no yeah i'm gonna go right beside <laughs> I'm not supposed to. let someone else go yeah let yeah, someone else yeah. go someone else should be there um that is a narrative and a belief that i have to continuously fight and overcome um and like i said it does it does find its way back and it's been, it's been like that. It's um, been like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You Interesting. Know the crazy thing about that. So my favorite animal is a wolf. Mm -hmm. And what I love about wolves, they're always in a pack, teamwork, family. Mm -hmm. But the leader is always in the back of the yeah. pack. 
because he wants to make sure he can see everything that's coming. So instead of looking at yourself as small, maybe you're in the back for a reason because you're guiding everything, especially as yeah. a coach. Like yeah. you have to play the background and listen, but you in, you are guiding those people. So yeah. mm-hmm. in turn, you're really the leader. You're helping people find their spotlight, mm-hmm. but it's also a balance of not shrinking yourself so much. And it was like a real big frustration you know, speaking of my parents, it was a, my dad used to get so frustrated with it because I was always trying to play the background roles. Like Beyonce impersonating aside, that was <laughs> even that. I auditioned to be Michelle. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be Destiny's babysitter. I'm gonna be. Uh, not the, I auditioned to be Michelle. Yeah, yeah. But there was this power that kind of propels you forward but i would always resist it to be like no 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 let someone someone else is better suited for that spotlight and it's that scarcity mindset like there's not enough room uh, for gotcha, gotcha. all of us and i don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie loose loose l-u-c-e uh-huh. there's this like really powerful scene with octavia spencer and uh, so essentially she plays his teacher mm-hmm. and she's got this student and he's um, he's a black boy and, you know, he's like captain of the football team, varsity, like the one that's like really going places. Even that way I said that, the one that's really going places. <laughs> that in and of itself yeah. is like, again, that scarcity mm-hmm. mindset. But he is going places and because she's, you know, one of the only black teachers in the school, she just would hyper focus on him, mm-hmm. you know, and his behavior and, you know, just always elevating him and treating the others like trash. <laughs> and he, w- he, ca- he got to this place where he was like, why are you doing this? You know, like, why, why are you keep putting me up on a pedestal while everyone else is just, you know, not getting that same shine? And she was like, because we're in a box, we're in a box and there's only small cracks and only a little bit of light can come through. There's not enough light for all of you. So when you find one that is gravitating towards the light, you lift that one up. Yeah. And it was like that is this crazy mindset that we do have around, especially I think people of color in the sense of, because you always think about like diversity. You think of, you think of your presence as like a quota sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm like, the only one here. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm the only one here. Or, oh, they already have one. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? like, so that's probably the like that. So in comedy it. for a while, it's always this one big comedian every five yeah. years. Like, well, so black comedian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, black comedian. Yeah. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Yeah. So what about in a partnership, like yeah. business partnership? His strengths are some of my weaknesses and some of his weaknesses are my strengths. So for him, he has the gift of gab. I let him do all the networking. If it has to be a face, send him. I like the creative stuff. I like the behind the scenes stuff, but I feel we're still both leaders. Yeah. So it's not, I don't feel like I have a scarcity mindset when I let him take the spotlight no. because this is better suits him. Yeah. And I think that that's the differentiator there is, is ne- isn't, it's more like that is where my strength is. And if mm-hmm. you, but if you look at my past, mm-hmm. you'll see where I light up. Yeah. You know, like you'll see that I'm a this, look into my past and you'll see like I'm this really quiet, shy kid who didn't talk to people, who didn't look people in their eyes. But if you put me on stage, suddenly you're like, who's this person? Mm-hmm. I wanted to be an actress. Like there's a core of me that really craved to be out front, yeah. but I would find ways to go behind. So like those are some of the patterns that you look for. And it's not to say that I'm, it's, it's, it's more to, cause you, to your point, like, and there are people who aren't interested in mm-hmm. that, you know, yeah. and they're just like, no, I really like playing this role. This is a role that I gravitate towards. Mm-hmm. But I know when I put myself in those positions, there's a friction that happens because I'm not living my truth. Yeah. That makes sense. So there's a friction, mm-hmm. which is why like my, my dad would get frustrated because he's like, I actually know that that's not your truth. It's gotcha. a truth that you're selling yourself on so that you can be comfortable and not put yourself at risk. And because you have a belief that, you know, the people who are close to you, like they are, they, they already got the one spotlight. There's no more room. That's it. <laughs> they, already, they already have one. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. it. I want to lean more into truth. So I know your clients, 
for in order for you to help them, you gotta they got to share some uncomfortable truth. So, how do you go about having difficult conversations in business and life? However, I think the big thing there is positive intention. Mm -hmm. When clients come to me and they expose difficult truths is because they believe that there is a positive intention um, where I can challenge you. I can hold a mirror up to you. I can be like, you got a booger in your nose. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh, have a, you have a proverbial yeah, yeah. booger. Proverbial booger. <laughs> I, think, I, I, yeah, Shan was, Shan, I think Shan was, said that on a podcast. Yeah, and my dad, it was something from my dad. <laughs> um, but you can lean into that space if there's trust that we know that there's positive intention. It becomes very difficult to have um, difficult conversations when you lack that positive intention or that psychological safety with someone because you're afraid that it might be used against you mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So I think that that cultivating relationships with people, cultivating trust mm -hmm. makes and expressing like these challenges are not to make you feel dumb. You may feel embarrassed in the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Rome, how you felt when all of it. No, <laughs> <laughs> sound like you was crying. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. yeah, there's that there is that moment, but you can override that with the fact that actually this is leaning towards positive intention. Mm -hmm. So let me keep going. Let me keep having this conversation. But that's, that's the biggest thing. So whenever, you know, we talk about business, you, there's, um, there's a, a, an, an author by the name of Lencioni who talks about, you know, five dysfunctions of a team. And essentially, if you want to create a high performing team, there's five elements that you have to have. And at the bottom of that pyramid is trust. Because if you do not, there's trust and then there's conflict right mm -hmm. above that. Because if you do not have trust, then you can't have conflict. You have artificial harmony. And it becomes like positional leadership where exactly. you're, just, you're just filling a role and nobody really trusts you. Or if you don't exactly. have trust when conflict comes, that's it. That's oh, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. So you can't yeah. have difficult conversations with people. You can't express your ideas, you know, because um, you're afraid to rock the boat or status or like break status quo mm -hmm. or get kicked out of the room. Mm -hmm. So that is the fundamental of building that trust with someone so that you can have those difficult, they're still difficult, mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least, you know, they're productive. So I wanted to, well, one reveal to you, cause I haven't got a chance to sit down and talk to you, but um, new things have been happening. Uh, I am now a new creative director at a health and wellness agency. Hey. So that's, that's great. I'm also- I feel the urge to high five you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the urge. Uh, 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 yeah, one more. Woo -hoo. Um, then also, me and Cam are new creative directors for another media company as well, um, which this channel is on right yes. now. This, yeah, like, this podcast so is on the Come Up, the Come Up uh, series, and we're also moving this year things we also have high frequency which is our business and what we've realized is that business changes three to four times before it finds its its thing it's already changed like once mm -hmm. who knows where it may go again after that so it's a lot of stuff going on and you being a business coach and my business coach I'm already starting to feel a little bit of the overwhelmness and I'm trying to figure out where I should place my priorities now that I have all these like responsibilities or how I should like schedule these things out and I was wondering if we could talk about what's it. making you feel overwhelmed <sighs> all right um here we go <laughs> <laughs> I think one with this new position with the uh the agency it's it's like I'm coming to a, into the fold. I'm new there. So it goes back to the imposter. I'm, I'm new there. I want to make sure stuff is right, make sure. And they, they're giving me a lot of responsibility in the sense of, hey, you lead this. You can run this. I'm trusting you with this because it came out of the blue. Yeah. I have to tell you the whole story off off air. 
And then we have high frequency, which we just started. Um, and we're trying to make sure that goes the right direction, what it has to do. Um, luckily, I have a great team with me to do that. Then also, there's the Come Up series, which is here now, and making sure that goes in the right direction. So it just feels like I don't want to I don't want to mismanage each thing, you know. I want to make sure that each thing has its, I think it goes back to our baby's theory. Each baby needs to have clothes, and I don't know what baby needs the most clothes right now in this, <laughs> in this season of, of life. Which baby are you most excited about? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm most excited about all the babies, yeah, you're not but most excited about all the babies. There's one baby that's. I'm most excited about high frequency. Know. That's my that's that's my business. So like I'm most excited about that. But here's the funny thing. All these things kind of it meshes well. meshes like <laughs> into they all each other. Serve each other. So it's a weird baby here. It's a triplet. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a triplet. They all share. You know what? That's good. It's he's, a triplet. He's learning coaching. It's, it's a triplet. It's, it's a triplet. So I know with triplets, you, I guess you just gotta. You know, tend to well, each. one trip, we always got to come out first. It, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, definitely high frequency because I, I see the future of it and I see how it could benefit in all of these situations. So I think it's to me uh, making sure I stay stay in it. This is a we've been in. We talked about focus season before, but it's probably my most important focus season because moving, possibly going out the country, moving to Seattle all these things so it's like okay no time for play play everything has to be scheduled aligned and all those things so i think that's the overwhelmness is coming from like all right i'm scared of what's next possibly what is the overwhelmness causing you to question in yourself am i ready am i you We've talked big game, you know, we we here, we've talked all these things, but now it's here. Me and him kind of both had the same talk uh, last week and we was like, oh, it's here now. <laughs> it's, it's here. We've signed paperwork is, you know, it's it's here. So now it's like kind of like what you were saying, the, the spotlight there. Now we got to now you got to walk into it now. So I think that's kind of what it is. So maybe it's a little bit of the imposter thing. You know, Keep I, going, though. Am I ready? Keep going. Am I am I ready? Am I ready? Um, yeah. Am I ready to step into the position of full time creative director? And am I ready to step into the position of full leadership in in this uh, arena? Um, am I ready to position myself as someone who is a, a leader in this this industry or this this media that we're in? You know, am I ready to? Uh, be able to hire and lead a, a team of people and make things function well. So, all of the things. Can all I step them. in, maybe yeah. from an outside perspective? Yeah. I believe he is ready. I think his weaknesses sometimes is in the details, but then that's one of my strengths. So it's like I balance that. So, uh, but the other things that he's talking about, stepping in spotlight being a leader, being able to run a team, having ideas, I think he, he will thrive in that. It's just the little things, sometimes like details, and if he could, you know, he could have somebody for that, but of course he should work on it. So, am I ready to let some things go? Am I ready to let go of things that I used to tie my value to in order to step into a new level? Hmm, okay. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Oh, he's rubbing his legs. I see, yes, she got, you got him rubbing, rubbing legs. Rubbing legs. <laughs> rubbing legs, y'all. Okay, um, time value to... Tell me about the details in Rome. Like the, the dorm tame in Rome, and then the... Because he said, if you agree with his observation, yeah. that spotlight, you're ready. Mm -hmm. It's the details mm -hmm. where you find yourself gravitating towards what is it what's your relationship been with the details. details i think not knowing how to prioritize but then also i think prioritizing the wrong things i think that's that's probably the that's probably the detail of it prioritizing the wrong things which i've learned now that i can't do that so i think stepping into this new thing is like maybe I'm, my body's like oh god let's make sure we don't 
don't prioritize the wrong things. Let's make sure we stay focused. Let's make sure, because if we don't get focused, everything's going to go to shit. Like, I'm not going to be able to do anything. So that is probably that thing of, like, I've been down before, and I am not trying to go back there again. So I need to make sure I do everything in my power, and I'm probably not giving myself any bit of grace in this in this season. So that could be where some of it come from, too. Well, how would you know... What would need to be true for you to feel like, absolutely, I'm ready? I'm not sure what would need to be true. I think what need to be true is just me, me showing up and the, the things are moving like they're supposed to be moving. But go ahead. I was thinking maybe the first project you got to have to do. Possibly. Like, successfully. Be like, All Possibly. Right, I can do this. And Possibly. This what you need. Yeah, so maybe what, what needs to be true is that this first venture as new creative director is like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I got some rhythm here. And so that, that could be it. But I also have to understand that I've, I've already been, we've, I've been doing this for a lot of years at this point. Yeah, I so think the only that. thing that makes a difference is you stepping outside of outside, us. Yeah. Because we've been creative directing yeah. everything we've done, but working doing with it other people. on other people's vision probably, and their yeah. babies is probably what. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's that right there because your relationship with Cam is known. Mm -hmm. It's, I know if I do X, Y happens. Mm -hmm. And you can predict your future and you can predict the outcome mm -hmm. of what's going to happen day to day with Cam. Mm -hmm. In this other world... <laughs> <laughs> you can't predict people that I don't know. <laughs> you're, you're not just stepping into the unknown. You're stepping into a world where I don't even know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's true. And in that space, it becomes very easy to justify and gravitate back to the known. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, I don't even know how to generate success here because mm -hmm. I haven't tested the people, I mm -hmm. haven't tested the processes, I don't, I'm still learning the expectations. So it's, I don't know what I don't know. I've got what I know, but I don't know what I don't know. And mm -hmm. I don't know if what I know is enough for what I don't know. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's probably it. Yeah. Okay. But the details working with Cam, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So now you're potentially at risk for redoing your children's bedrooms. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Clinging to the walls. Yeah. Yeah. Or justifying getting back into the details but the awareness that the details actually don't need you. Mm -hmm. You need the details. Mm -hmm. I like it. All right. I'm going to take that and uh, I'm going I'm to... I'm the details I'm, don't need you? I'm going I'm to I'm play on the details not need me. I'm going I'm to play on that. So, so back, in, back in your cousins would say, stop being scared, dog. <laughs> <laughs> stop being you scared. Got it. You got it. Just you got relax. It, stop being scared. Yeah, no, it is definitely yeah. comforting knowing you have somebody here. But like you said, the outside is a whole nother, whole nother realm. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, like, I like that. but even that, it's like being able to actually name what that is mm. for you. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about like naming it to tame it all the time. Because when you can give that fear a name, when you can give it a story, when you can give it a narrative, mm -hmm. then you can start to step outside of it and be like, okay, so I know what it is. I know what it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I problem solve my way out of it? And what do I need to look for? Because when those things come up, like I said, even with the, my narrative of playing small, it mm -hmm. will sneak. Yeah, it's sneaky. Yeah. It's sneaky <laughs> to yeah. the point where I'm like, I will justify. I'm like, no, but I need to do that. Yeah. No, but that's yeah. fine. You know, um, it's supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. But I have to check that narrative because I know what to look for. Okay. And now you know what to look for when you find yourself gravitating to the details mm -hmm. because you haven't proven this yet. Absolutely. Okay. You have a theory. I have a theory. Like you were saying, theory? even with moving. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah What's yeah. your theory? My theory to this whole thing. Um, this is our path. We talk about it. Yeah, all the time. I, I, this honestly. Is, this is what we were built for. This is what we wanted. This honestly. Is, this is our path. It's all, and it's all been aligning so specifically and so like organically that I'm like it only makes sense that this is the path I'm supposed to go down and it may be for a time, short time being may be for a long time being but I know I gotta get through it's like I can see the light 
at the end of the tunnel, but it's a little crocodile here, it's a little little spiders over here, a little, <laughs> but I can see, I see the light, so um, I just gotta, you know, gear up and get through the tunnel. I mean, that's, that's what it's about. And I think when you kind of look at it as like a theory, like I have a theory that this is what I'm supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. that this is what it's all been going towards. So it's just a theory, it's not a truth, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a theory. Mm -hmm. And your job is just to conduct small experiments to give you data as to whether or not that theory makes sense, is, yeah. makes sense yeah, if it's yeah. plausible, if it's alignable, you know what I mean? Because you may conduct an experiment and be like, ah, I hate it here. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. hate everything about this. Mm -hmm. I don't like how I feel. I don't, know, I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like the people I'm working with. That's a variable. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's just new data new to data. the experiment mm -hmm. of this is where I'm supposed to be and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And when you look at it like that, failure becomes acceptable because no one ever goes into an experiment with the belief that their first attempt is going to be nailed mm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They look at it like, we're going to have to try something. Yeah, we got to Except Kanye. Yeah, except Kanye. Except Kanye. <laughs> except Kanye. <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. love how we both came here and got coaching. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Listening to cutting people off. And... I think uh, where, <laughs> I think well, the last thing I want to ask is like, we, we, we talked about this um, a little while ago and it's like, will we all of us and everybody can speak will we ever come to a point of satisfaction and i'm you shaking your head no i mean I, i'm sure he believes no i i think there's a to me isn't what because if you're saying in life like because i always feel like it's, life's an evolution mm -hmm, forever mm -hmm. growing so no, I always feel like it's just more for me to learn. I haven't learned. Mm -hmm. I'll never know everything, so I can always just be better. But what are you saying? Would you be satisfied? Is there a satisfaction in career for entrepreneurs? Because you know we always shifting. Is life can be satisfying, but you may still be like, but I need to do something. <laughs> it's hard for me to say give you a definite yes because the way my life has been. I didn't predict I'll be doing it. Yeah, of course, of course. So of I never course. know what I'll be doing five years, 10 years from now, but the path I'm on right now, I'm satisfied with being on that path. That's okay. the best I can give you. Gotcha. And I think, and we, you, you kind of put it in a great way too, because you kind of, what did you say to me today in the car? We were talking about being set, like hungry. What, what oh, did we yeah. say? Well, I was talking about, yeah, like, can you, can you be sad? Can you be unsatisfied and happy at the same at the time? At the same time, yeah. As well. Right? Can you simultaneously be both? Yeah. And, you know, when I think about that, they seem like counterintuitive because if I'm satisfied, then I'm happy. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm unsatisfied, then how can I be happy? Um, but I kind of was looking at it like, you know, when I'm full, I like when I hear like satisfied at, at the end of a meal or something like that, like, you know, the waiter comes around when you finished your meal and mm -hmm. you're like, would you like dessert? And you're like, no, I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. Like I'm good for now. Mm -hmm. Right. That doesn't mean that, but eventually I'm going to digest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually enjoy the journey. I don't necessarily enjoy that state of being satisfied. I enjoy eating. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy getting to that place where I can digest, mm -hmm. reset, and be like, I'm ready to eat again. I'm ready to try different flavors. Yeah, I'm ready yeah. to experiment with new recipes. Mm -hmm. That is the joy for me. That is the happiness for me. It's not in the feeling I feel at the end of the meal. It's the process. The process. So the journey, not the destination. The process of eating. I, yeah. I love eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. Um, I love eating. Too. And so when, it, when exactly what you talk about in terms of life is that, yeah, I'm going to get to a place where I'm going to appreciate where I've been. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to sit here at Lauren's table and high five over the accomplishment and the milestone that we've achieved. Mm -hmm. But don't get it twisted. I'm still going to eat yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. I'm satisfied today. <laughs> but tomorrow, but tomorrow I gotta, yeah, 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 for I'm sure. still going to want to mm -hmm. eat. And that's, that's actually what you love because you love mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. And you don't know today what opportunities await you five years from now mm -hmm. because you're going to learn so much more. You're going to be in motion. You're going to be exposed to new things. You're going to uncover different talents about yourself mm -hmm. that you may not have paid attention to before, but you're mm -hmm. like, what is this over here? And then eventually you're going to get to a point where maybe your version of the next version of more satisfying, maybe it doesn't have to do with career. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's expanding on something else in your life. Yeah, yeah. But either way, I think that 
if we're constantly in a state of expansion one way or another, then it's kind of acknowledging that satisfaction is a temporary state. And it's a good state to sit in for a minute, mm -hmm. but keep going. 